Hey everyone, welcome to session 129 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. All right, it's September, it's back to school time, and in this day and age, school is looking a little bit different for many students. In my neck of the woods, school districts are doing a variety of different things. Uh, Some are doing full remote or online instruction. Some are doing some sort of hybrid between those two. And then some school districts are full in-person So it's hard to tell what impact this might have on our children's ability to learn the basics. And it's with this in mind that I'm grateful to have Michael Maloney on the show to talk about his 40 plus years of experience using direct instruction and precision teaching. In this podcast, we discuss the history of direct instruction, including the simultaneously fascinating and tragic story of Project Follow Through, how Michael learned about direct instruction and applied it to not only school settings, but also in the context of remediating adult illiteracy. We talk about his initial forays into running his own educational centers, as well as the instructional software solutions that he's developed over time. Michael's also been generous enough to give away many free instructional materials, so if this is something you're interested in, check out his website. It's called MalonyMethod.com. We also mention a variety of other resources, and you can get access to all those things over at the website. Check out BehavioralObservations.com, session 129, for full show notes. Today's episode is brought to you by the 2020 New Hampshire ABBA Virtual Conference. It's taking place on September 26th, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers this year. They include Dr. Solande Forte, Deb Grosset, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. And in acknowledgement of the financial impact of the pandemic, New Hampshire ABBA has enabled a variable pricing or kind of pick-your-own-price Uh, format for conference registration, which makes it super affordable. So for more information on that, check out nhaba.net, and I hope to virtually see you there on the 26th. We're also brought to you by my friends at Praxis Continuing Education and Training. They have two great ACT and RFT classes coming up that seem really cool. One is called Understanding and Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts with Dr. Siri Ming and Tom Sabo as well as acceptance and commitment therapy with parents with Drs. Lisa Coyne and Evelyn Gould. These are live online courses where participants can ask questions, get feedback, etc. right on the spot. So for more information, go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And when you enroll in these, use the code observations to save some money at registration. Last but not least, two-time guest and digital marketing guru Rich Brooks dropped another 60-second lesson for ABA business owners. In this installment of the ABA Marketing Minute, Rich Brooks talks about how to get your business to rank highly for local search results in Google. So I hope you check that out. And if you're interested in a free 30-minute webinar on building effective websites for your practice, check out takeflight.com forward slash ABA Minute. Okay, I think that'll do it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fantastic and wide-ranging conversation with Michael Maloney. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Michael Maloney, thanks for joining me on the Behavioral Observations Podcast today. How are you doing, sir? I'm very well. Nice to be here, Matt. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, same uh, same here. I know you're you're up in Canada, uh, and I'm out here in New England, and uh, hopefully it's not as hot as it is uh, here. We've had a bit of a heat wave as we're recording this in late July, but uh, it uh, it certainly could be a lot worse. So again, thanks for taking some time out of your uh, your summer to chat with me today. The first thing I want to talk about is uh, the, 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 actually there's so many things I want to dig into, <laughs> uh, so it's hard to know where to start. But I always like to start with asking people how they got into behavior analysis. With in, in particular in your case, I know that uh, uh, you've been doing this for quite a while. So when you kind of describe your first kind of contact with behavior analysis, it would be great if you could also kind of describe the scene at the time, because as we both know, it's drastically different 
than it is today where, you know, there's many, many ABA programs and lots of opportunities for training and things like that. So if you could kind of contrast that to the way things were back when you were first getting your feet wet, that would be an awesome place to start. Well, uh, I was a teacher to start with. So I spent, I graduated in 1964, uh, just as the ice was melting. And basically, I got a job in what I thought was going to be the world's best school because it was run by the Jesuits, who were supposedly renowned as teachers. So I uh, spent a year there, and I found out that they were just cherry-picking. I mean, their students were all very bright, very well-to-do. They didn't need me any more than they needed two heads. So I moved up the street to the next school, which was the worst school in the city, and I wound up with a class of 42 grain diners who uh ninth graders who none of whom were there for the first time and their their joy was creating trouble and i would have been just great fare for for that kind of problem if i hadn't been their football coach and i worked very hard with these kids and at the end of the year despite them committing to helping themselves and us two or three of us tutoring them the system just washed them out. They were turning 16. They didn't have to be in school. So despite the progress they made, the administration just literally threw them on the slag pile. I quit right then and there. And I went back to University of Western Ontario to get the biggest, heavy, heaviest degree I could find. Uh, it happened to be in behavior analysis. And uh, at that point, the department had two behavior analytic teachers. And uh, I made good friends with them. And that's where I learned about people like Fred Skinner, Fred Keller, you know, all of the heroes of the past. And we were still fighting the rear guard against uh, Sigmund Freud at that point in 1964 to 68. You know, with regard to that, uh, you're, so you, did you know what to look for? You know, I mean, ABA as a brand did not exist at that point in time, I'm assuming, or at least it, it, if, if it did, it was, you know, no, it was, it was a rounding error compared to what it is now. Yeah. I, uh, so, uh, so I didn't know what to look for. Okay. So, uh, I got lucky. I okay. got lucky. Uh, and uh, Mark Reber and Fred, my other uh, good friend there taught me what I needed to know. And I, uh, well, yes, about the, the time, this was Vietnam war time. And I was an activist, so Mm -hmm. I was involved. And the department chair didn't like that. And so she told me I I had to stop. And I told her, the world's bigger than your Skinner box. Get a a life. Well, she made sure I was not going to graduate. And so I moved on to University of Waterloo. And that place was loaded up with behavior analysts. And so I got really good training there uh, in the psych department. So when I left there, I decided to come back into education, and I came back as a behavioral psychologist. And when I was hired by the local school board, uh, on the very same day, they hired Eric Hott, and I'm sure you know who Eric was. Mm -hmm. And Eric and I met at a meet and greet on the first day that we were working there and became blood brothers. Uh, He was Ogden's first PhD graduate from University of Kansas. He had precision teaching, you know, in spades. I had just come from working with Zig Engelman out at the University of Oregon for the summer, and I was really hot to trot with direct instruction. And we immediately saw the fit. It became, you know, absolutely obvious that these two should work hand in glove. And so we started putting them together. And that was great. Very powerful. Can, can you just take a moment? I know we're going to get into this with, you know, because I we want to talk about project follow through. Maybe we should just go right there first, because uh, I was going to ask you about Zig and, and, and for those who don't know who he is to talk about him and his contributions. <laughs> um, and uh, but I think in order to do that, we, had, we probably need to talk about project follow through. So I would I would invite you to kind of take that in whatever order you, you prefer. That's fine. Let's let's take it as a project. Let's take it for what it was. 
1968 when the tanks were rolling through Watts and like 400 people got killed in the city of Detroit by troops and, you know, uh, various cities in the United States uh, were burning to the ground because of the, of the race riots. Uh, and it looks like we're there again. But in any case, uh, the president, Lyndon Main Johnson, looked at it and said, we got to get this stopped. So first of all, he put the troops in the street to quell the riots. And when they settled down, he said, OK, we need a plan. And he, he put out what he called the war on poverty. And among that global plan for the redemption of the American society was an edict for the uh, education department. And it was that they were going to find a way to help kids who were poor and or rural and or of color or whatever to get them so that they could participate in the American dream. And it was called Head Start. But before Head Start was even a year old, they realized it wasn't going to be enough. So early learning was important, but it wasn't sufficient. So then they decided on Project Follow Through. That's where the name comes from. They were going to follow these kids through the primary grades in school and make sure that they got a good grounding in the fundamentals. And they invited everybody and his dog who was in education to join. Uh, and if you joined, and if you read Kathy Watkins' uh, What Works, you'll, you'll hear all this, uh, everything was paid for. The training of your people, the, uh, the school supplies that were needed, everything. And they spent $750 million in three years. And at the end of three years, they had an independent organization that went in and did annual and once every three years reports on what was going on. First report came in, 75% of the variance in the data was accounted for by one model. The only other model that had any impact at all was behavior analysis out of Kansas City, at, at University of Kansas. And uh, they, those two units, those two components of 16 accounted for all of the progress. The other 14 just fell flat in their face, some of them so badly that the control group outperformed them. So it was behave. So it was direct instruction accounted and for the the, the most was, uh, the the most improvement of the students plus uh, yeah, behavior, behavior analysis, analysis, which was going into classrooms and getting classrooms under behavioral control using you know good behavior analytic techniques. Uh, that's great to get them in their seats, but it doesn't do much for teaching them. And that's why it's only twenty five percent, and direct instruction is seventy five percent because I see. it basically kept the kids in their seats and got deans, academic deans. So behavior analysis basically, excuse me, wound up uh, number one in everything. And they took that back and, and the Department of Education or the Director of Education kind of said, well, we, we can't show that to the president because the society was nowhere near accepting behavior analysis or direct instruction or anything that was structured. This was like teach the child, the whole child period, right? Piaget, mm -hmm. things like that, very unscientific stuff. And so bottom line is they decided to replicate the experiment. So another $750 million, another three years, a different set of evaluators, six years later, same results. So now what do you do? Now it's not a, an academic problem. Now it's a political problem. Mm -hmm. So it's very simple. Being politicians, they just replicated it again, spent another $750 million. <clears throat> Results were never published. <clears throat> if it weren't for uh, Doug uh, at Columbia, Doug Green, Doug Greer, sorry, at uh, Columbia University, we probably would never have seen the results. He managed to get his hands on a copy of the original study, and he blew the whistle on. Today, I'm going to tell you how to get your ABA practice to rank higher in local search. My name is Rich Brooks, and I've been helping therapists and businesses get found in local search for over 20 years. Whether you have one location, several locations, or you visit patients in their home, people are searching for local providers. So Google serves up the top three results alongside a map in what's called the local pack. 
Your goal is to get into the local pack for all your appropriate keywords. You can use the free tool Moz Local to find out what your current local ranking is and how to improve it. One of the most important steps is to make sure your practice is listed at the website Google My Business. Once you claim your listing, you can optimize it with photos, videos, keyword-rich descriptions, and more. Beyond that, mention your city and state throughout your website and embed a Google map of your location on your contact page. I couldn't include everything I wanted to share in just one minute, so for more advice on getting into the local pack, visit takeflight.com slash ABA Minute. And you think it was just because of the, some anti-behavioral prejudice and, that, and that, that, that's the only thing that accounts for the large-scale kind of ignoring of well, the, the, these <laughs> what sound like very profound and compelling data? Yeah, it was very profound and compelling data, Matt. But let me ask you a question. What is the major reinforcer for school districts? Oh gosh, uh, that's a loaded question. No, uh, it's not. It's one. It's one simple answer: calm. Okay. The one thing they want is peace in the valley. How they get it, they don't care. So, if you go into a school district with this kind of new tool, which is going to disrupt a whole lot of what they already do and make force them to learn a whole lot of things they don't know and use it and be held accountable for it, you're smoking something. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it didn't take off. Nobody wanted it, except of the occasional behaviorist. I see. So, this was back in the... 68 to 78. Yeah. yeah. Um. And, and so I guess take us forward a, a bit then, you know, where does direct instruct? Well, actually, hang on one second. Let's get on, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get on a same, I guess, uh, footing here. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, there's going to be some uh, portion of the audience who knows what, what direct instruction is, or I guess, I guess DI as it's uh, referred to in shorthand. Um, but for those who don't, what is the thumbnail sketch of what, what direct uh, instruction? It's dead simple. Dead simple. It's called, uh, Pick a domain of learning. Take that domain and analyze it and see if there are any rules that you can draw from it. Extract those rules and make them explicit. Then you build a script that teaches the rules and you teach examples of the rules and non-examples of the rules. And then you get the kids really good at being able to discriminate examples from non-examples on the basis of the smallest possible difference that exists between them. So if you take the final E rule in reading, you can have a word called pan, P-A-N, and you teach them a rule. E at the end of the word makes a vowel say its name, put an E on it, now it becomes pain. Man becomes main. Tap becomes tape, and so on. So first of all, you teach them non-examples. Then you add the E. When they can do both of those lists easily, and, and the only thing you do is wipe the E out and then let them run the list as non-examples, put the E on, let them run as examples, and then systematically, in a random way, we take out half the E's. Now they're forced to make a discrimination based on a rule they know and the smallest differences between an example and a non-example. And you can do this with anything. Can do it with deductions, analogies, fractions. And that's what Engelman did. He he created this. Brilliant. So, where where did DI go? I guess you know. See, you said there were a couple of you know kind of uh, random behavior analysts or be like minded behavior folks, as I like to say sometimes, that may may have had some training in this, uh, you know, did it go underground or who was, was it, was it not no, practiced for some period of time or, yeah, you know, it, I'm just trying to think like water. It was dead in the water because the same argument that happened with follow through and the reason schools didn't change that argument prevailed. And there were a few martyrs out there who paid a big price for putting direct instruction into some setting. Uh, Carmen Marcy, uh, a, a, one of Zig's doctoral students, doctoral graduates, uh, worked in a prison in Cook County 
it was actually a high school. They took all the bad apples, put them in one school, ha handed them to, Mar to Carmen Marcy. And she reduced the recidivism rates to the court by 75% over three years, and they closed the school. That's amazing. No, it's not. It's what's happened just about every time. It's what happened to Eric and I. So, well, what I mean, amazing in terms of reducing the recidivism, not amazing that they closed the school, you know, I mean. Um, oh, <laughs> well, it's, it's, she did a really good job. Right, right. Um, and, and so, again, I, I just keep coming back. To, well, let me ask you this. Are there, are there, did, to your knowledge, has any public school implemented any form of DI? Yes. Uh, the public schools that have done it are usually charter schools. And there's one set of charter schools in and around Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, run by Baker Mitchell. He's got about 2,000 students. And they are using pretty much a straight DI uh, curriculum. I see. Now, uh, I guess one, are, do you know of any, I guess, just regular old non-charter schools, non-private schools, just regular, you know, uh, okay. Elm Street Elementary School in any town USA or any town Canada or anything like that, uh, or England, what have you? There are some out there. They're very, very light on the ground. And you have to remember the charter schools are public schools. I, I, yeah, I know, I know, but you kind of have to put a little asterisk there to some extent because there's obviously it, it comes with, uh, you know, that it, that the, the, I, I don't want to get into the the, the weeds in terms of what, dis, what distinguishes a, a a charter school from a you know a typical school, but um, there's certainly some differences that are you know that are considerable. I would have uh, ventured to guess. Um, but yeah, I was just kind of thinking, like you know, especially in these days where uh, testing is the you know is the norm, and there's at least uh, lip service as it relates to the emphasis on improving test scores. Um, I know in a lot of the public schools that I consult to, and I'm consulting more on problem behavior, not necessarily on on instruction. Uh, I. You know, there seems to be an increased focus on looking at, you know, student achievement data. You know, they have, you know, uh, you know, some of the schools I work in, especially those that are considerably impoverished, have, uh, you know, these these data teams. And again, I'm I'm not involved, so I don't know exactly what they do or what data they look at and how they change relative to those data. Um, but it, it's yeah. it, I'm, I'm not saying this all to be skeptical. It's just surprising that the fact that you've got this thing that's been demonstrated multiple times in very robust studies and uh, yeah. and in combination of this this pressure to improve reading uh, and and math and through standardized tests that, that no one's looked at this. But Matt, you know about follow through, uh, but you also probably know about no child left behind. Mm hmm. Okay, well, when no, no Child Left Behind came to the fore, there was supposed to be a marker that you were supposed to hit with every kid. And if you didn't, your fees and funds for the next year were going to be affected by it. That never happened. Mm -hmm. And the charter school movement were supposed to get a five-year charter, and if they did a good job, they could get a, a second one. And if they didn't show annual yearly progress, they weren't supposed to get a second one. Well, the only charter schools I know of that ever closed were charter schools where someone ran off with the money. So if you talk about accountability in education, student performance is not even on the list. I mean, how many teachers do you know of who got fired because at the end of the year, a third of their kids still couldn't read? Answer, yeah, zero. zero. So in the contingency-based world of education, what is the reward for not doing well with kids? What is the punishment for not doing well with kids? There is none. Right. You get a year of seniority. You get a little more in your pension. You get a raise. And you get another batch of kids to ruin. Now, don't blame the teachers. I am one. 
Yeah, my wife's a high school English teacher, so okay, I should well, disclose. <laughs> yeah, in all fairness, uh, they're knocking themselves out, but the way they've been trained and the tools that they're trying to use, there's no hope that they can, unless they find pixie dust, that they're going to be successful with all of their kids. We do a horrible job in both countries, Canada and the U.S., in terms of training teachers. And, and supervising them and supporting them. So, you know, if you're looking for a reason why we're failing, we are sending rookies into sites that are only fit for hardened, you know, battle-ready, battle-tested professionals. Yep. That's why half of them quit. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that is noteworthy when you're in a public school is that the the ratio to uh, supervisory staff, and I'm just, you know, we maybe use the word administrator interchangeably, but it's not necessarily that, it, it's, it's not that they're actually doing active supervision of, of, of teachers, in my experience. <laughs> right. Um, Absolutely right. But they're the rate, not. The, the, you know, if you look at, you know, say what goes on in your garden variety ABA clinic, the the, the amount of supervision a registered behavioral technician gets from a behavior analyst in terms of the implementation of their uh, ABA curricula for kids with autism uh, is is quite, you know, it's often or should be quite intense. And that's been my experience and when I've uh, been in those settings. Uh, and then, you know, you contrast that considerably with a public school setting where, you know, there's 60 teachers in the building and there's three administrators and uh, there's very little contact with them unless there's a problem or, you know. Uh, Until there's a problem, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know, you know, uh, and I, know, I know a lot of this has to do with basic, you know, various rules and things like that. And some principles are much better than this than, than others I've seen as well. So I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, certainly. But uh, I know, you know, my wife, when she gets observed, uh, you know, gets like, a, you know, a week or two of notice, you know, and, and, and not, you know, I mean, prepare your best lesson. Yeah. 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 I mean, fortunately for her, uh, student achievement is, and student well being are, are, are very high on her list of reinforcers. So there's some, there's some natural contingencies working for her and she's, you know, I'm not saying it's just because my wife, well, maybe just a little bit, but she's, she's a very, very good teacher. Um, and is successful with her kiddos. But uh, yeah, so it just, you know, anything, you know, it, it just kind of flies in the face of what you would see in any other professional context. Uh, Absolutely. And so. And, and hence the failure rates. Yeah. And, I'll, and the I'll illiteracy throw another, rates. I'll throw in another thing too. You know, a lot of times what happens is, you know, the, you know, I, I see this more in secondary ed, but um, you might have a principal who uh, may have been a, you know, in a different discipline, you know, my wife, you know, is teaching, you know, upper level English literature, you know, and so if you have a principal who was, uh, you know, uh, a PE teacher, uh, you know, or, um, you know, uh, a math teacher or whatever, you know, it's, it's going to be a, the, um, they might not have the, the sophistication to, to adequately soup, you know, provide feedback and whatnot, you know, because, they they come from a different background and don't have that particular skill set and with which to adequately uh, supervise and provide you know meaningful input. Yeah, they don't have they don't have the tools. How can they do it? Yeah, they were never trained. They're like their kids, never been taught. So, uh, I, I I know you. One of the things we wanted to talk about today is because you've put together, you know, we've kind of adequately kind of described the problem here. And I know you, you're, you're a solutions-based guy. Uh, and I, I, I know uh, you've put together some, some online tools or an, an online tool I want to talk about in, in just a minute. But before we leave this, uh, you know, I guess depressing as <laughs> segment of the, of the conversation in terms of the state of affairs, what, what, why do you think the teacher training programs are also kind of ignoring what's, you know, considered evidence-based, I suppose. Well, first of all, the people who are the professors in most of the schools of education are not behaviors to start with. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, they have no interest in a science or B data. 
So they don't read the articles that you and I read. So how can they teach that to their kids? They, they think it's perfectly okay to substitute talking for teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've taught at university. I've taught at colleges. And I turned that on its head really quickly. So the first class that I taught, I asked them to simply write down as many behavioral terms as they possibly could in one minute. This was a, a, a graduating group of behavior analysts from a community college, right? This highest score, 18. The lowest score, three. The median score, 11. That's, and that, they didn't have to define them. I would just write them down. Things like reinforcement, yeah. punishment, things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Terms, nothing more. Well, what did that tell me about their training so far? And they're about to graduate and go out in the field and pretend they're behavior analysts. But it tells me they don't even know the lexicon of their own, their own discipline. So the next week I walked in with a, uh, a booklet that had the 100 top terms of behavior analysis and their definitions. And I gave them to them and I said, put these on, on SAF med cards, you know, put the term on the front and the definition on the back. And before you get out of here with a grade from me, you have to be able to let me shuffle that deck, hand it back to you. You go through them as fast as you can flip cards. And unless you can hit 30 a minute, you're not getting a, any, any grade other than incomplete. I have to imagine given the, the, those, given what you're telling me about their baseline performance that they probably haven't had exposure to this type of timed drills. Uh, what was their reaction to that when you first did that? It was close to mutiny. <laughs> okay, that's what I was... Ask me if I care. <laughs> well. I mean, if I'm going to trust you with somebody's kid and you have the, the behavior analyst tag and you know what you know now, you are a dangerous, not only to yourself and that child, but to the entire profession. I yeah, I understand that. I was just curious. Did did, did their attitude uh, change? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, yeah, well, they got well, smart. They liked it after a while because they could see their they could read stuff and understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fine. Only two or three kids didn't grad didn't get a, a an A because that was the only other other mark there was. A I or see. I, your choice. Got it. Got it. And A equals thirty cards per minute with zero to two errors. So you just so you know what we're playing. Hey everyone, uh, in case you miss it at the top of the show, I want to give a quick shout out to my friends at Praxis Continuing Education and Training because they have two great ACT and RFT classes coming up. The first one's called Understanding and Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts, and that's taught by Dr. Siri Ming and Tom Sabo. And the second one is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents with Drs. Lisa Coyne and Evelyn Gould. These are online courses, but they are synchronous, which means that you can ask questions, you can get help, you can see clarification in real time. So if you want more information on this, hit the show notes for today's episode or go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And if you decide that either of these classes are for you, use the promo code observations to save some money at registration. All right, let's get back to Michael here. I feel like I'm jumping all over the place, but I want to get back okay. to your, uh, cause I want, I want to get to cyber slate in a minute, but I, I, I at the, before we do that though, I, I think it's important for folks to know a little bit about more about your background. So you started to tell us a little bit, we got kind of sidetracked on project follow through and DI and things <laughs> like that, uh, which was great. Cause I think it was good foundational information that sets the context for, you know, kind of what we're talking about. But, uh, you know, you, you've had kind of an amazing career, I, I think, and that's probably an understatement in terms of some of the things that you've done and, and you know, centers you've started and things like that. So uh, I want to give you an opportunity to kind of brag on yourself for a little bit, or at least talk a little bit about kind of where your career evolved and some of the things that you did, because, you know, the, some of the stuff was, was uh, well, I'll just stop talking and let you kind of take it from there. So, <laughs> Well, Matt, uh, it's not like I'm special because I'm not. But I have had special situations and special mentors. I mean, who would have had a, not had a success if you had uh, 
people like Fred Skinner, Carl Binder, B. Barrett, and all of those people that were around Boston and Harvard during that period, and Ogden Lindsley among them. And then you have Ogden, Ogden and Eric and Elizabeth Houghton uh, out of the Kansas group. And then you have Zig Engelman and Doug Carnine and Linda Olin and all of the people out of out of uh, University of, of Oregon at, at Eugene. And you have them as your mentors. And you're working with them and they don't get this. Zig doesn't get that Og has a piece to contribute just like Fred and the people who started behavior analysis had a piece to, continue, to contribute. They each saw their own particular silo. And Eric and I were standing there looking at this saying, these got to go together. And we started putting them together. And we were fortunate because we were in a school district that had two very powerful superintendents, what you would call directors uh, in the U.S., but they're superintendents here. And they, they protected us. Nobody wanted to battle them because they were the toughest two superintendents in the building. And they'd take your head. So Eric and I got to do whatever we wanted. Frank, my superintendent, only ever asked me one question. We'd be sitting in a meeting, something would be proposed, he'd turn to me and say, Michael, is that good for the kids? And I'd say, yes, Frank, it is. Or no, Frank, I don't, know if, I don't think it is. And that would help make his decision about whether this was going to go forward or not. So we were able to go into schools and train teachers in precision teaching and direct instruction, behavior analysis, and get those classrooms really nicely under control and working like just firing on all cylinders. Well, that feels pretty good. So we did that for three years. And then Frank retired and um, the other superintendent uh, took a position as a director of, of a system and left. So we lost, uh, we lost our background, we lost our protection, and we were gone within a year. Just like Carmen Marcy, just like others I know, I can point to 15 different places where this has happened. So uh, I just decided to start my own learning center. And I did. Uh, and within a couple of years, it became a school because the parents said, tutoring isn't enough. You're never going to catch this kid up two hours, three hours a week. Well, you need to start a school. You need to take these kids all day. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I didn't want a school, but, uh, you know, you got to do what you can do. And so we started a school and it was, it was huge fun. Um, I had Anne Desjardin who would later went out and worked with Kent Johnson and uh, married Tim Slocum and moved to Utah and started her own school. Right. So my whole job, is to be Johnny Appleseed. I'm planting seeds. You know, birds are going to get some, thistles are going to get some, the dryness is going to get some, but if I keep planting, they're going to keep growing. They're going to keep spreading. And that's, we've just tried it a lot of different ways. And some of them have worked and some of them have been complete failures. I see. And so, um, now, if I understand correctly, you opened a number of locations on your own as well. Is yeah, that correct? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we grew a company from one kid, one blackboard, one desk, one chair into a $5 million company. I mean, and again, nothing of my doing. It was just happenstance. I'm in my office one day. A guy comes in. He's from the Workers' Compensation Board. He says, I've got a guy out in the car who can't read. Can you teach him to read? I said, sure. So we brought him in, and we had our first workers' compensation board client. Well, this guy knew 10 other, kid, 10 other workers who were injured, who, could, who were illiterate. And in Ontario, at least then, if you were injured on the job, you got 85% of your salary until you could get back on the job. Now, among these people were a portion of people with soft tissue injuries, and they were never going back to that job because they couldn't do it anymore which meant the province would get to pay them until they were 65. So they wanted these people in programs so they could get a different job, a new job. 
Okay, so one that didn't require as much like physical labor. Yeah, or something like that. I had a lot of roofers, a lot of truck drivers, a lot of construction people. Right? Guess what? One thing they all had in common: they were illiterate. And we would take them, run them through a DIPT behavior analytic program, and in twelve months, we would do what the schools had failed to do in twelve years. And we'd send them off to college, typically into technical type programs because they had to make good money. They couldn't go into social programs and come out at 12 bucks an hour. Yeah. Right? So, and these guys just tore it up. I mean, they wanted free of workers compensation board every bit as much as, as the board wanted rid of them. And they worked real hard. And 92% of them, when we followed them up, were able to finish the first semester of college successfully. 65% of the school boards did that. So, you know, I mean, it just it just kept growing. People would come say, oh, listen, uh, can you work with this guy? And I, no. Why not? Well, he's 40 minutes away. By the time he drives here with a back injury, he's done. So, you know, well, can you build a center here? Sure. Yes. And we wound up with 10 of them spread across the province. And if it hadn't been for a a legal battle I got myself entangled in with a friend who was supposed to be a friend and wasn't. Uh, we, we went, I just told him, uh, I can rebuild, you can't, because I know how to do this, you don't. So mm -hmm. I don't care if we tear it down to the blocks and bricks. I'm not giving it to you. And we went five years in the courts, and he's he long since gone, and I just restarted. I see. I see. That's that's that sounds like a sidebar for a, for a different day, perhaps over a, <laughs> a beverage. So, uh, um, it, so as much as I'd like to kind of pursue that, let's uh, uh, so let, let's um, let's talk about this this program you started. It's called uh, Cyber Slate. Well, Cyber Slate was the very was one of the early attempts. Cyber Slate was started in conjunction with uh, uh, let's see. West, Hart West Hartford, Connecticut, Ian and Aileen Spence. And they came to see my learning center uh, and they wanted one like it. So I helped them get started. And the same with Kent Johnson, the same with a number of people. Uh, they came and saw what we had and said, okay, I want one of those. And we would, we would do what we could to help. And Ian loved computers. So he started messing around with this uh, digital method for keeping data on the chart. And that was CyberSlate. And uh, we got it done and he just kind of took it over and he used it uh, in the Ben Bronze Academy. But he was not a marketer. He was not a salesperson. He's not an entrepreneur. He's, he was a computer geek and a good teacher and a good administrator, right? So it never really went anywhere. Uh, we had already done Mighty Math, which was a, a precision teaching system for teaching fundamental math concepts and uh, marketed it. So I knew how to do the marketing, but we just never got to it. So CyberSlate kind of, it's still there. It's still at Ben Bronze. It's still probably working, but it's never really broken out like a lot of DIPT projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where, um, so I'm sorry, I must have con confused the, uh, uh, so is there, what is the program that, that you are, uh, are launching? Okay. It's called Teach Your Children Well. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> That's okay. I, got, I got my That's wires okay. crossed. And, and, well, and, no, there's lots of wires to cross. I mean, this is product number 10 for us. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's not, not surprising you would not be able to pick that one out of the pile. All right. Last promo of the show. Check out New Hampshire ABBA for their virtual conference on September 26th. Awesome speaker list. They include Drs. Solon de Forte, Deb Grosset, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandos. There is flexible pricing in case you were adversely affected 
financially by the COVID-19 pandemic and so much more. So check out NewHampshireAbba.net for more details or hit the show notes of this episode. I hope to see you there virtually at the New Hampshire ABBA on September 26th. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Michael. It's an attempt to solve the problem we face in behavior analysis today. Behavior analysis is growing like a weed. You know, the BCBAs, there's now almost 80,000 of them, apparently. There are another 30 or 40,000 RBTs out there. And so they're not any better trained than our teachers. The BCBAs have a, or have a master's degree, makes them eminently trainable. But there are no practical applications that they have to dis- have to demonstrate before they're allowed to go out and practice with with real kids. And my my idea is, it's very difficult for them to a find good tools like direct instruction or precision teaching. The last webinar I did uh, last week, fewer than thirty five percent of them had any training in direct instruction or precision teaching. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's entirely surprising. Uh, We can debate whether or not that's a good thing or not. And I can probably guess with a reasonable degree of certainty your opinion on uh, the or your answer to that question. And I I would probably also, you know, I, I think the supervision process is designed to make sure that there is some you know, uh, 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 practical uh, application that is that is you know um, th- that is supervised by a mentor and things like that. So I would, I would, I would gently push back against that sort of th- you know so that I, notion, yeah. and I would also say it's not perfect <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah. So, but um, uh, anyway, uh, go go ahead. Uh, well, a, a lot of it, you know, if they're working with the discrete trial situation, which most of them are, then at least they've got data. Right. So they, they, they get that. That's good. As far as that goes, that's great. And Ivor Love Us did a wonderful job of bringing that into, into the discipline. But I come from a background that says if you're a behaviorist, you look at counting the frequency of behavior. And uh, that's the influence of Lindsley. Right. And so basically, uh, we have people who are not grounded in that. They've never, it wasn't part of their BCBA training. They also, if it was, it was very slight. Mm-hmm. And they also, at this point, cannot find decent training. Uh, and to find supervision is even more difficult. So, and they're very busy people. Many of these are young women with young children. Absolutely. They, they got, they're up to their eyeballs in things to get done today. So to go out and look for how do I add these tools to my repertoire is not a very inviting proposition. Yeah, especially in a situation where no one's requiring you to learn them. Well, of course not. Yeah. And change is painful. I'll put you outside your comfort zone. And and that's that's a little frightening. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, you have to understand that there the contingencies in which these people are are currently working. You, know, you have to take into account that it's more than not more than likely than not that an insurance company is going to have a big hand in the decision as to who gets how much money for the treatment of this child on the spectrum. Yeah, you know, like they should be making that decision. I don't think so. They don't have any data. They don't have any procedures. They have the money. They have the source to be able to source the funding. And they wield that over our BCBAs and our clinics in a way that's really pretty painful. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we will have a lot of waste and wasted effort, wasted money, wasted time as a result of that because the BCBA doesn't get the chance to a get good training and use it, and b select their own children uh, and, and candidates and treat them in a way that's going to help them. So it's it's a very imperfect situation. So 
what does uh, teach your children well do with rel- relative to that problem? <laughs> well, since you cannot easily get trained in direct instruction and precision teaching, it's the easiest solution to that, and I, it took me 10 years to figure this out, is to bury the technology inside the device so that you don't need to know how to present a direct instruction lesson. Let the, let the computer do it for you. You don't need to know how to collect the data and record it. Let the device do that. So we simply took the two of them, put them together, and created a system for teaching reading to beginning readers that will act just like a good direct instruction teacher and will keep the recording uh, just like a good precision teacher. Now the person, all they have to do is sit with the child and hit one of two buttons. Next, if the child got it correctly. Back, if the child needs another model lead test correction procedure to have another chance to get it correctly. So let's, let's, let's take that out of their hands. Let's make that invisible, uh, but available, so that they can, as Engelman would have done, teach them the entire scope of what you're going to learn when you learn how to read and the order in which it's going to be presented to you, and the discriminations that you're going to learn, like the final E rule, and all the other bits and pieces, all the 14 different things you need to know as a direct instruction teacher. I'm just automating the whole process, essentially, except for the signaling of correct or incorrect. uh, Well, uh, that's just to move the stakes, right? We need to do it again. I'm not satisfied you get that perfectly right so let's try that one more time click or nice job and it even reinforces them i mean the the reinforcers are built in there as well with the point system so if they're collecting points so they can make cookies when we get enough points that's there too plus the fluency checks you need to be at 50 sounds a minute if you're not there we're not moving on i see and this is uh uh this is something that's been uh, 10 years in the making no, it's been one year in the making. Okay, so, so it took about <laughs> 10 years to figure it out. So, Well, the, the, the 10 years was trying to find a voice recognition system that could distinguish D from P from B. And if you can't get those right, you're done. I couldn't find one. I couldn't create one. So we decided to go to video instead. You know, it, it's, it's about two weeks away from being finished. Okay. Very cool. Um, and, um, how can people uh, learn more about it if they're interested in, uh, you know, test driving this, seeing if it's right for their yeah. clientele and well, we, like that. we were working on that yesterday and basically we're going to have a, a buy it, a try it and buy it, uh, choice for someone who already knows they want it because they, they, no one like DI, they'll just go ahead and buy it. Uh, and they'll buy sets of either five lessons or 10 lessons at a time. And they'll, when they need more, they'll come back and get more. Mm-hmm. And the, for the people who don't know anything about it, they can get the first five lessons for free. And they just work their way through it. And by the time they get to the fifth lesson, they'll have their first fluency checks and their kids will be doing 50 sounds and sound combinations a minute with no more than two errors. And they'll be reading a word list that they can't read now. Uh, They're mine. When they see their child change that much in that little time, they're going to want to continue. So is the end user in mind a a parent with a, with a child struggling to reach here, a teacher? Can you, can you read? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Okay. So when I've had my coffee, Okay. Could you tell if the child said that correctly or incorrectly? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're now the instructor. All right. All right. Um, what, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I was, I was thinking about some, uh, um, you know, we're embarking on the, the fall here very shortly and mm-hmm. uh, schools and uh, I'm not so sh- sh- sure how much it's going to be disrupted in Canada, but I know here in the United States, it's just the same game. 
Uh, Same game. Yeah. So things are going to be se- severely disrupted in most yep. communities because Absolutely. of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, what, uh, what advice do you have for, you know, let, let's say, you know, someone's interested in, in teach your children, but, you know, may or may not be able to get it or, um, or let's say it's not out, you know, at, at that point in time, you know, what, what would be some, you know, if, if you're a parent, you know, a lot of the listeners to this show are, uh, as you suggested earlier, are, are, are parents with young kids. Uh, they're going to be balancing numerous uh, uh, challenges and, and, and yeah. priorities in terms of their time commitments and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, well, how would you advise a, a parent of a young child who, you know, wants their kid to develop good reading and math skills? Or, you know, what are some, what are some, uh, whether they know how to chart or not or anything like yeah, that, you know, yeah. what, what, um, and, and I know there's the obvious answer of get to teach your children, but just putting that aside, pretend that doesn't exist for a minute, you know, just, you know, what, what would be some take home, you know, uh, advice you would give to that, uh, that individual? Well, I, I would tell them to go to teacher uh, to uh, maloneymethod.com, uh, our website, because when the coronavirus hit, it was very clear to me that there were a lot of parents out there that were unduly stressed, afraid, confused, and feeling very much set upon because their child was no longer going to school and they had the responsibility to try to do something to keep the child in the game. So we took all of our books and published them as PDFs and put them up as sets of blocks of five lessons on our website for parents to download for free. Now, you know, the direct instruction is highly scripted. So all you got to do is read what it says and wait for the child to do it. And if he doesn't show him, model it for him. So he knows what to do and then do it again. Right. So that will add some clarity and some order to their attempt to teach. So we have now, about 40,000 different lessons downloaded by people around the world right now. And they're going out the door faster than you can imagine. And so these, these are products that you guys have developed over the years and well, now you're, you're to, basically yeah, giving them away. We, we sold them, right? That was, that was our livelihood. But we've got these parents who are in a very severe situation and we just said, hey, what are you going to do to help? And the answer was, well, first of all, let's find someone who can help us get them distributed. So I went to a former international president of Rotary. I don't know if you're familiar with Rotary. Yep. Okay. 1.2 million members around the world. And uh, this person, uh, Wilf Wilkinson, said, yeah, Michael, I'll help you get that distributed. So Wilf then went to all of the other people in Rotary and said, Make sure your people know that they can go to this website and download math and reading and spelling uh, as much as they need uh, until whatever happens, right? So that's our contribution to the battle, you know, because we're all in this together. Yeah, well, it's extraordinarily generous. So uh, it's definitely, definitely commendable. Um, <laughs> What would Fred Skinner or Ogden Lindsley or or Zig Engelman or any of our good behavioral colleagues have done in the same situation if they had the opportunity? Yeah, they'd say, "Hey, this I'm on the team. Let's let's get it done." That's awesome. Um, I know you mentioned you had a time commitment here shortly. Do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, I'm good until ten minutes to eleven. All right. Very good. So um, I uh, got some questions from uh, members of the uh, Behavioral Observations Membership Program. And mm-hmm. so um, I, I, I can always count on them for sending in some really, really insightful uh, things. So um, the first question is from Deborah. Uh, she said, I took the Maloney Method CEU online course, but I still have the following questions. Uh, How do you help others build an environment conducive to using the Maloney method or even just then to get them uh, to start better integrating instructional design without making people feel threatened or that they're doing things wrong? She has a couple parts to this question. So I'll just start with that piece first. 
Yeah, and that was the exact challenge that we faced when we went into special ed in public schools 40 years ago. Same situation. You've got teachers who are ha have a way of doing things. They're not eager necessarily to just turf all of that and find something new. So you have to start with the ones who are willing. Uh, and I would guess that that will probably get limited in our experience to about 10% of the teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that 10% will become great uh, advocates for, this, for the work and they will learn what they need to learn. But at the same time, Unless you can provide them some supervision, you're, you've got a big, big task on your hands. When I was in working with the school district, I could go to 10 different schools every week and supervise the people who were there hands-on watching them. Now, how you do that now in a COVID world, I don't know. Maybe using Zoom while you watch them teach. Uh, again, there's all kinds of issues around that, privacy issues and school issues and firewalls and all of that. So, uh, But you, you have to go with those teachers who show an interest and who want to have better tools. Uh, I hope that answers the question for Deborah. Sure, sure. Um, with, I guess, a follow-up question to that is that, uh, you know, how do you how do you build a you know so let's say you've had this ten percent you know kind of cohort mm -hmm. or cabal or whatever you want to call it <laughs> coachery yeah. uh, and uh, how do you broaden the culture well, you know that's that would be yeah. supportive of this sort of thing I, you know and you know and I know you you chose the route of I'm just going to start my own school and so I can I can have well, a little bit more you know there, uh, what's that old expression uh, God give me the knowledge to know what I can do and know what I don't be able to do can't be able to do and the difference between well uh, that's what you're working with in any organization. There are things you can affect. There are things you're not going to affect. And hopefully you learn the distinction between which of those two, you know, the wisdom of not trying to do the impossible. Uh, I would suggest that once you get to about 10%, you will begin to get resistance. Uh, and the only way to overcome that, that I've ever had any success with, is to show them the kid's performance. They they can't refute that. They can refute your data. They don't care about the data. It's never been important to them. But a recording of that child's voice reading this story that he two months ago he couldn't have read the first sentence of, that's compelling. Mm. So I would I would be pretty heavily into recording uh, kids' performance. Okay, never thought of that. You know, I, I was I was before you mentioned the recording as an as, a, as an example of that I was puzzling in terms of what the, the distinction between performance and data w was, but that makes all the sense in the world. Um, all right, great. Uh, so Kay asks, uh, my question for Michael is: uh, Are places like the Roger Bacon Academy or similar charter schools? Do they uh, take all students, uh, you know, do they serve students with like extreme challenging behaviors like physical aggression or severe communication challenges? Um, you know, she had, um, you know, Kay, Kay uh, consults quite widely to uh, educational uh, centers in the Midwest. And, um, you know, uh, so she's seen situations where if, uh, if I'm rec recalling the other parts of her email that she sent me correctly, um, where, you know, charter schools are great and they do wonderful jobs, uh, but they're, you know, there's a selection process that, you know, it may, you know, so well, they may or may not take all comers, you know, I guess is the, is the larger point. Have you seen time. these types of settings deal with kids with extreme uh, behavioral or, or communication needs, I guess, is the, is the larger question here? Yeah. Uh, the, first and foremost, we need to be clear on the fact that charter schools are public schools and they do not get a choice about streamlining and selecting their kids. They're not like private schools where they can just decide they don't want you. Until each of the classes is filled to whatever those numbers are in that contract, then they have to take those children. Now, if you were to look at, uh, 
you know, the school that said Baker Mitchell has set up in North Carolina, he takes all kids. But if that child is going to be a complete disruption to the rest of the class, they will go through a process which will wind up taking that kid out of the school in a relatively short period of time because they cannot provide the service that this child needs. Now, they are allowed to do that, but they, they go through a process of, of attempting to use their behavioral control to get these kids able to stay. But if they can't, they will, in rare occasions, actually dismiss a student from the school. And, and this is after some sort of attempt of uh, a functional yeah. analysis and behavioral intervention and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, yeah, again, that's that, those are really hard decisions, right? And I, I, as a principal, and I happen to be a school principal, I was never forced to make those. I was very lucky. Uh, my kids played by the rules because we insisted that they play by the rules. And, and I never had one that was so out of shape that they couldn't or wouldn't follow the rules. So I, I, I was very lucky. I see. All right. Uh, last member question from Jen. Uh, let's see. Two questions, as a matter of fact. Uh, any tips for adapting fluency-based instruction in a virtual environment? Are there specific factors instructions should be aware of when delivering this instruction virtually that could prevent a learner from going as efficiently as they might when done in person? Wow, that's a, that's a very forward-thinking question. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, um, you have to know what you're teaching. I'm, I'm assuming she's using direct instruction, precision teaching materials and, and presentations in her, in her remote teaching, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's more, probably more on the PT than DI, but certainly uh, I know Jen. Uh, Jen and I work together, actually, so uh, um, her colleagues. And um, uh, yeah, so I, I, we're, we, we've both been kind of learning more about PT over the last couple of years. So yeah, certainly in, okay. that, in that philosophic uh, framework, if you will. Okay, well, then in that case, uh, I would say the first thing you need is a good scope and sequence chart. You need to know in each subject, whether it's language or reading or spelling or math, what is the scope of the activities that I'm going to teach this child? And then you need to understand what's the order that these need to be in in order not to confuse the child. Well, that's dead simple because you can get that from the scope and sequence chart of any direct instruction program. So that now gives you a, a, a nice lead into what am I teaching today and what am I going to teach after I've taught this? So, And then the next question becomes, okay, how good do they have to be? So if I'm teaching the child sounds, I don't want to teach them alphabet sounds. Abacadu. That's a good way to confuse a child. Right? I want to teach them a, m, and t. Why? They don't look alike. They don't sound alike. You're not going to get those confused. And mm -hmm. so we lay them all out carefully so that the order works. And then we say, okay, how well does he have to know it? Well, do a 30 second timing. He better be able to do 25 to 30 uh, in a minute with no more than two errors. So now we've got a, a, a goal, a standard, a measurement, and a decision point to, to know when we can move on. I see. Now, <laughs> we, we just did that for her. So Jen could simply get a subscription to teach her children well and save herself a lot of time and trouble learning stuff. Um, it's a uh, int good segue to the, her the next part of her question about developing aims. You mentioned, you know, I can't remember was it twenty or thirty a minute. Uh, how do you develop an aim that's specific to a learner, specifically when the learner might have uh, various types of delays, whether processing delays, development delays, etc. Uh, essentially, adapting aims for non-traditional learners. What what are some good practices for figuring out okay. that? Uh, Matt, you've got a degree, right? Yes. You got more than one? Yes. Okay. And I have an unfinished one too. <laughs> oh, okay. You're working on a doctoral degree? <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm kind of permanently ABD. So, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> it's like, uh, if there's emeritus status for ABD, I've got it. I'm, the, I'm there. We're both there. Okay. So 
if I gave you this task and you did it, and then you taught it to a student, and that student can only do it as well as you can, how are they going to do in this wild and woolly world we live in? About as well as I can. Okay. Uh, how you doing? So, <laughs> so basically do it yourself to, to develop. Yeah. The okay. Yeah. If you don't know, get them at least as good as you. Mm-hmm. I had, I can tell you a quick story on that. I had a kid. Well, walk well, in. Can, can I just, just, be, yeah. so what, what if you're, you know, um, what about in the case where you're working with a kids uh, with some sort of cognitive delay or something like that? Would well, you, that be you too don't know high? What that is. You have no idea what that cognitive delay is until you measure it, right? Okay. Okay. So let's find out. Let's measure it. So if you, we, I have a student right now we're working with, and he only speaks at 120 words per minute. Most people speak at around 200 words per minute. But he can only manage to speak at about 120 right now. And that's up from 100 six months ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we teach him to read stories, we have to adjust the standard down from 200 a minute to 120. He can reach that standard and he's gradually increasing his, his rate of speech. Maybe we'll get to 200 someday. I sure hope so. But he's looking more and more like your average kid every day. So if you're, if you're, well, how how do we do that? We took information he would know well, personal information. What's your first name? What's your last name? What's your dog's name? Right? How old are you? And all of that. And he would just say in full sentences, he would say, "My name is," and and we would count the words. And this is stuff that he, I mean, has known since birth, right? Mm-hmm. So there's nothing keeping him from being able to respond other than his rate of speed, his speaking speed. Is that kind of like the, the rapid automatic naming stuff that uh, uh, Carrie Millica has done? Are you familiar well, with her work? Yeah. Any of that stuff is, is the same game, isn't it? Yeah. But, but the question is, are you doing it as, as individual nouns or verbs, or are you doing it as full sentences? We wanted him speaking full sentences because you're going to be reading full sentences. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, it depends what your what your aim is here. I see. So we uh, and that's that's the individualistic aspect of of teaching and learning. If this child cannot speak at the rate that normal humans speak at, then you've got a choice. You can determine what can he do, and where are we going to adjust the standard, and what do we think might happen over time as we build the, the uh, composites or the uh, com- components into a composite. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Uh, I th- uh, Michael, we've covered so much ground in such a short amount of time. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to, uh, any other final thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience? And uh, yeah. related to that, where can people learn more <laughs> about you? It would be MalonyMethod.com. Okay, I would like to suggest to all of our behavioral practitioners that they start collecting some data upon themselves, right? I see a lot of people who are out in the field working as behavior analysts who have no personal data on a chart or on a scale or anything of their own. Well, if you want to learn something, try, you know, being the physician and heal thyself. Uh, This is a uh, little counter I'm using right now. I'm counting the number of times I wash my hands every day. I see. And just for the folks listening to this, that's a bead counter, it looks like. so. It is a bead counter. A simple uh, shoelace with a tab that clips to my belt, right? And why am I doing that? Well, I'm 79 years old. I'm in the middle of an epidemic. And one of the things you can do to protect yourself is to wash your hands frequently. Well, I've been at nine, eight or nine hand washings per day now for close to a month. I see. And it's, yeah, I've got it charted and I'll be presenting that from time to time. That's cool. You know, I, 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 
I couldn't agree more. You know, my uh, my major professor was Jim Johnston, and uh, oh. he used to tell us that uh, <laughs> you know if you're not measuring your own behavior, you're not a behavior Good. analyst. And, and I, 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 I I apologize to wall. Jim if I've if I've mischaracterized that statement in the passage <laughs> of a couple of decades, but uh, I think uh. that's I think that was his gist. And uh, yeah, so I've uh, uh, and I ignored that advice for a long time, to be completely honest. And uh, right. you know, one of the things that the the blessing of uh, I guess the uh, 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 silver lining, I guess, to some of this downtime from the pandemic is that uh, you know I, I I've kind of returned to doing some of that stuff. So I've been measuring some of the uh, my own you know good. Uh, uh, personal behaviors that I've, uh, that are of interest to me that I want to you know uh, improve or change or what have you. So. Couldn't agree more with that. It's great, great uh, sentiment to leave the the audience with. So, okay. Jim Johnson's nobody's fool, <laughs> <laughs> as you well know. Yeah, it's because uh, I try to be his grad student. You know, yeah, uh, no, it was great. Uh, yeah, he's uh, yeah learned a lot from him and yeah. uh, a lot of the other just really awesome people down at Auburn. So, all right, okay. all right, uh, Michael, this has been a fun conversation. The uh, MalonyMethod.com is where folks can learn more about you. That's uh, thank you so much for making all that, uh, all that, all those resources free and available. Uh, and we'll cert- be sure to put all that information in the show notes. So thanks again for joining me today. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks thank again. you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at behavior podcast. <laughs>